Hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thanks for attending PlatformCon 2023 and the session on bl a blueprint to platforming Kubernetes operations, where we'll talk about the key challenges when it comes to building platforms on top of Kubernetes and how we can overcome those challenges with different design considerations and just some general thought leadership. So when we talk about four key challenges that every enterprise needs to figure out, the first one is cluster lifecycle and upgrades. The second one is standardizing software add-ons across a cluster fleet. Uh, for example, making sure that they're running on the latest versions. The third one is multi-tenant consumption and RBAC, especially when you're running a shared services platform between different development teams. And of course, the fourth one is developer self-service, especially as you're building out your internal developer platforms, making sure that there's a great DevX uh, that's powering the Kubernetes experience. So let's look at how we can uh, solve some of those key challenges and how we should think about these. So today, developers are being blocked by a lack of self-service capabilities. And when we think about this, we have the CFO, for example, who's saying we need to save on costs, use shared clusters. We have your security teams who are saying we need to make sure teams are compliant, isolated, don't step on each other. But the problem is there's a lack of ability to bring those governance capabilities into developer self-service, or they're not being thought about in tandem. And so what happens is the developer still has to go through a complex service now ticketing process because ultimately DevOps is, is required for implementing those governance capabilities. And this can take days to weeks. Whereas the ideal process should be that developer says, I need a namespace for my application. They use an internal developer portal, for example, something built in Backstage uh, to create a namespace with one click. And all the policies, for example, cost, security, resource quotas are embedded right in place. And so what we see here, and this process, of course, should take seconds, right? So what we see here is a requirement that developer self-service has to have governance uh, capabilities uh, required. And governance is meant to enable developer self-service. It's a yin and yang. And so when we talk about this yin and yang, um, essentially, you know, for developers, when it comes to Kubernetes, they want to be able to consume and provision infrastructure, for example, cluster as a service, namespace as a service, through a friendly interface. But they expect the resources to be always available and scalable, and they don't want to have to know the underlying infrastructure details, like node groups, AMIs. That's not their concern. They want to be able to provision uh, apps, test code changes, that's their ultimate goal. For platform engineers, for example, though, they need to deliver a shared services platform on Kubernetes for all internal users. And so they have to have the ability to impose company-specific requirements around add-ons, cost management, without impacting the developer experience. So let's talk about how this model can be achievable. We'll start off with looking at a Kubernetes platform architecture. So when we look at a Kubernetes platform architecture, we first see that it serves multiple internal stakeholders, not just developers, but SRE, security, support, FinOps is something that's been gaining a lot of trend. For example, how does a FinOps measure different uh, costs for Kubernetes resources across different business units? A Kubernetes platform should be able to support the necessary front-end interface that makes your internal stakeholders successful. So whether that's Backstage, a UI for FinOps, a CLI, or a GitOps for SRE, ideally, a, a, a robust Kubernetes platform should be able to support multiple interfaces and have the API contracts be the same. Then you have your backend, and your backend contains, of course, the infrastructure components, and of course, is powering a great developer experience with sat catalogs, templates, uh, docs. But of course, you have to also solve for the day two components. So you need SRE capabilities for troubleshooting, you need observability for logs, and you need to support the shared services platform side of things. So you need security and governance capabilities, for example, multi-tenancy network policies, and of course, supporting uh, different services around Kubernetes like registry and secrets management. So all of these are needed, but the key thing is start with what is thinnest viable based on your organizational needs and use a platform as product approach uh, to measure success and know what capabilities you have and build it in a roadmap style. Now let's look at those four challenges that I was talking about earlier and talk about some de uh, design considerations on how we can solve for these. So the first one is cluster lifecycle without disrupting developer operations. 
some of the key requirements here are, of course, being able to perform cluster lifecycle and upgrades without disrupting developer productivity, staying up to date on the latest Kubernetes versions, potentially even using custom AMIs uh, when as necessary, for example, in EKS. Now, let's take a look at a potential design consideration with rolling upgrades and infra GitOps. So for example, let's say I have a 123 uh, cluster spec in Git that represents a current cluster that I'm running. Rather than performing the upgrade on that specific cluster, which is done by a lot of platform teams today, can we consider another design? Let's use a rolling upgrade strategy in GitOps. Let's start by just tweaking the Kubernetes version and copying and pasting into a new cluster spec. So for example, now I have a 124 cluster spec and you could have pre and post lifecycle hooks defined, for example, saying, hey, when a cluster is deployed, run a cube bench, run a deprecated API check to check for compliance, to check for those deprecated APIs. Uh, that can be as part of your GitOps automation as well. Next, what, you, what about the workloads that were deployed in this cluster? How do we make sure it gets deployed to the new one? Once the, this EKS cluster is run, the trigger is kicked off, et cetera. So the key thing is you can use a labeling strategy. So for example, let's say your workloads are marked with a, a, a prod label that is on this, uh, and that's a cluster label that's being used on the 123 spec today. You could have some GitOps automations or some pipeline triggers to say, hey, when any cluster is deployed and it has a specific cluster label that it maps that matches this exact cluster label, make sure all workloads that are also referencing that label get deployed to the new cluster. And so now all the pods that were running in the 123, the same workload manifest and spec is deployed to the 124 cluster, maybe via Helm or any other operation. And then you can just delete the 123 cluster spec. Or, uh, and that in GitOps, and that will trigger, of course, the delete of the 123 cluster in your system. So notice how we you can use infra GitOps for a rolling upgrade strategy. Now, as you consider GitOps as part of your strategy for cluster lifecycle, you should also think about whether you need uh, Git to system sync or system to Git sync, especially if manual changes are made in the UI or CLI by, for example, your security team or other stakeholders. Do you want to write those changes back to Git so Git represents a source of truth in the platform? Or do you even need a two-way system sync? Those are requirements that should be gathered by platform engineering teams as they're building out um, the platform and GitOps capabilities. So that was the first example of how we can do cluster lifecycle and upgrades and think about not just app GitOps, but infra GitOps as a way uh, to solve for some of these challenges. Now let's like, take a look at the second challenge of standardizing software add-ons. Imagine you're an IT professional at a large organization. I like to use this analogy. So typically, you know, you have your VPN software, your productivity software, antivirus, that IT defines a standard, that standardized set of software. And, you know, as a user, I can't modify that software and delete it. Um, I, I, that's, I, I'm not allowed to, right? And you want to be able to make sure as an IT organization, you can push that software out to different laptops that are running different OSs, whether it's Windows or Mac, doesn't matter. And then you want to be able to track that laptop fleet, have continuous audit, make fleet-wide updates, grant exceptions when needed, um, make sure nobody's doing something out of band, etc. So how do we solve for this? Because if you think about it, the same thing needs to be done for a cluster fleet as well. So when we talk about multi-cluster standardization and software add-on management, some of the key requirements, of course, are restricting which software add-ons are deployed to clusters. You want to use, be able to use software and versions that are vetted and tested by platform teams, being able to update a cluster fleet at once to avoid any discrepancies, and being able to audit and catch any drift in software when tampered with. So the first thing is you, you is you want to use a blueprinting strategy. Store the declarative spec in Git, maybe you can use a custom CRD and have basically a mapping of software add-ons to the latest versions that you want to be able to run. And you can also embed security and compliance policies that come with specific software. So for example, Cilium, if you wanted to use cluster-wide policies, you could and you have all your clusters reference, for example, default deny ingress, you can have those policies embedded as part of your software add-on templates.
Next, you want to be able to automate and standardize your add-on deployment processes. So you can use GitOps and you can you know, have you know, you know, multiple pipelines running in parallel to be able to deploy the software on multiple clusters. But even when you're running in hybrid cloud, for example, in AWS and VMware, you want to be able to call into one API in your platform. And then underneath the, the logic of how to install on AWS and VMware is taken care of by the API. So that way you're not maintaining multiple scripts, you're not having any discrepancies, et cetera. Finally, of course, audit everything. Always have a way to audit because that is something that you need platform engineering teams or you know your security team will come to you and it's like, how do we demonstrate uh, compliance and how do we demonstrate this to our customers? And when you audit everything, you can measure things like you know, which software is, is, is being deployed the most, which software is being touched or tampered with, and use those metrics to build drift detection and drift checkers. So if something is going out of band, you can include some automation to say, hey, don't allow this to happen. Don't allow Istio to be deployed from my clusters ever um, by a specific user, for example. And so this is a, a design consideration on how we can solve for multi-cluster standardization and software add-on management. Let's look at the challenge three, establishing multi-tenant governance and connections to Kubernetes RBAC. Now, the key requirements for this are being able to tie organizational roles and responsibilities to Kubernetes RBAC. You have operators, you have developers, they should be able to do different things in Kubernetes. But those permissions can be different per environment. Maybe you have a dev cluster, maybe you have a prod cluster, and those may require different types of access and permissions for different types of users. And then you wanna make sure isolation boundaries are maintained and teams should not be able to step on each other. So I wanna talk about one consideration around um, your identity providers and how you should map those to Kubernetes RBAC. So let's say you're running a Okta, for example. What you want to do is instead of having individual user mappings, use IDP groups. So you could have a developer groups, so operators groups, and then you want to map those to Kubernetes RBAC and have defined access rules for different types of environments using labeling or other mechanisms. So for example, developers may have namespace read only in prod, but they are able to create namespaces in the dev cluster and operators are able, have cluster admin privileges everywhere. And this could be done using role bindings in Kubernetes. Finally, you want to implement those RBAC controls. And of course, you want to have every API call and kubectl call to Kubernetes audited. And as you can see, those permissions are getting uh, seen here. Now, the key thing is doing all this IDP integration, SSO can be super challenge. And so what I recommend is looking at an open source project called Perilous, um, which is a way to enable this kind of uh, secure uh, Kubernetes access and to be able to integrate with your uh, identity providers. Now, challenge four is building the developer experience. We've solved for a lot of the governance challenges. Finally, now we're talking about uh, ID, internal developer portals and the developer self-service. So the key requirements is that developers need a simple way to provision Kubernetes infra for their apps. They want to be able to use the standard Kubernetes interfaces such as kubectl, and they want to abstract away from infrastructure and not have to know the, uh, the intricacies. The first step always to figure out is what type of Kubernetes access do you want to give? Do you want to give cluster as a service or namespace as a service or full-fledged environments as a service? And then figure out what is going to be the platform governance layer? What templates, what blueprints are these, uh, are these specific services going to use? So for example, when a namespace gets deployed as with via namespace as a service, it has a resource quota, it has you know, specific labels that are always necessary for the developer to be on that golden path. Then you can leverage backstage or IDP software that point to dev specific environments with all the info they need for app lifecycle. So for in this example, you can see with that we implemented at Rafe, they can download a secure cube config, they have access to basic uh, metrics, etc. And so that's really important that the developer should be able to play in their specific uh, background from a development point of view, from an app lifecycle point of view. They shouldn't have to worry about all different uh, namespaces, if they're just working within one namespace, for example. So just at the end, I uh, want to talk about, you know, 
So Rafe actually, uh, as a company, we power these four key enterprise needs for Kubernetes management. And we've done this with uh, many customers across, you know, fintech, uh, um, high tech, um, healthcare. And if you uh, want to talk with us, you know, feel free. And if you're dealing with a lot of these challenges, uh, feel free to message us uh, on the Slack or feel free to uh, message me on LinkedIn or via email. Thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy this presentation.